Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us here tonight for this very special After Dark, the opening exhibition of Self Made. Um, I hope, yes. A lot of work has been put into uh, this summer show that's going to be running through Labor Day. And so we're really glad to be able to kick it off with this great panel conversation that you're going to see tonight. My name is Sam Sharkland, and I'm part of the programming team that helps put together these After Darks. Of course, I'm not the only orchestrator and conspirator in putting this together, but just the one who gets to be the face uh, of this tonight. And I wanted to acknowledge as well that we're lucky enough to be in this beautiful site on the beautiful bay, and it, we're also on ancestral Ramatush Ohlone land, um, that to acknowledge the native land that we are currently on, I think is part of the process where we can continue to think about our place in the world, which of course the Exploratorium is expert at doing. Tonight's panel is filled with some incredible guests. We have a lot of thinkers around the exhibition. We have a writer, um, you'll get introduced to them in just a moment. But again, the intention of this exhibition as a whole is to start the process of conversations and discovery around this big, big, big idea of identity. Um, identity is pervasive. It, it um, is part of our, all of our lives. Sometimes we feel our identity more than others. In the exhibition, you'll find lots of ways to kind of experience your own identity. But part of that acknowledgement that it's a big topic, we realize that the conversations need to continue. So this panel is one of those places where we're gonna be able to start to unpack some of the ideas behind the exhibition. Um, and as well, we're continuing our public programs throughout the summer uh, in relation to identity. So this is the first of some after darks related to it. Next week we have the theme is mirror, mirror. The following week, hashtag selfie. The following week, uh, you are what you eat um, and self-styled. So all of these were kind of trying to continue to tease out other ideas around identity, of course, recognizing that they can't all be done in one exhibition or one night. So thank you for being here at the beginning of this journey with us. To get a couple of housekeeping things out of the way, um, if you need to exit, we have an emergency exit there that will take you outside the museum and in the back where you came in. Um, there is a restroom in the center of the museum as well where you entered if you need that. And please, of course, if you have any mobile devices or electronics, that should be uh, silenced uh, at this point. Otherwise, I'm happy to start to introduce the panel. Um, we're lucky enough to be in partnership with the New York Times, who brought us the perfect person to kind of start moderating uh, this panel. Walter Thompson Hernandez is a multimedia reporter based in LA, and a lot of his stories are covering emerging subcultures. So kind of there on the ground floor where we see these identities take form and flourish um, en masse. So we're very grateful that he's here to kind of kick off the panel. And without further ado, welcome Walter Thompson. Hello. Thank you so much for that, in, uh, for that introduction. I really appreciate it. And um, I want to thank everyone for joining us here tonight. Um, we have a really great audience. and. Is it packed to capacity? I think I, I see people standing up. That's always a good sign, right? Hey. <laughs> um, so we um, are really excited about this panel. I, uh, <laughs> what's going on? Man? It's, it's over, right? <laughs> are we done? Um, <laughs> okay, great. I'm gonna keep speaking. Um, I want to thank. Um, ahead of time, uh, the uh, maintenance and janitorial workers who will be here long after this event is over tonight. Um, yeah. You know, to help, I think, keep this m museum open for, for tomorrow, right? I believe. Um, we're really excited about this event and, and this exhibition and this talk. I think we had a really lively talk backstage that <laughs> we kind of want to continue. But this is sort of a moment where um, you know, this process of collaboration between curators, between um, the directors of the show, and between advisors and, and consultants kind of comes together in ways that we can have uh, hopefully like a fruitful conversation about what identity means, right? I think both personally, but also in our communities and in our institutions. 
Um, I was introduced, I am a New York Times journalist. I, I cover subcultures around the world. I've, in the past, I think, eight months, I've been in Ghana, Japan, Dominican Republic, uh, a couple other places where I usually um, work on stories about identity, um, about, you know, this, this, I think, pressing question about belonging and kind of I ask communities around the world if they belong or not, right? And, and, and understanding how complex that question is. And so um, this, this exhibition and this talk, I think, is, is a perfect segue for that. Um, we are living in, I think, one of the most divisive times, right? Regardless of political leanings, I think we can all agree with that. And I think um, our panel tonight and the people next to me are experts in their field and they've each sort of contributed to conversations around identity and really pushed that conversation forward in, in ways that add to the lexicon of words, right, and, and terminologies. And so um, I want to introduce them briefly. Their, their resumes are really long and extensive. They really are. And um, so I'm just gonna start uh, by talking about Ramsey Fawaz, who is a Professor of English at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with an emphasis in queer and feminist theory. Uh, Jennifer Eberhardt is a social psychologist and professor of psychology at Stanford University. Uh, she was the recipient of a 2014 MacArthur Genius Grant Award. And she has a new book <laughs> called, yeah, for sure, definitely clap. <laughs> um, a brand new book called Biased, uh, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice That Shapes What We See, Think, <laughs> and Do. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Ramsey's> book. <laughs> book as well. And we're also joined by uh, Melissa Alexander, who is a fixture here in, in this museum and yeah. in the city, and who um, has produced numerous award-winning creative projects and exhibitions, including the award-winning exhibition Revealing Bodies. Um, and so with that said, I, again, you know, you know, we're hoping this conversation can, can help us understand um, the exhibition in greater detail and, and sort of take, um, I think, a step forward in, in, in that conversation about identity. And so with that said, um, I kind of want to start with a very broad question, and I want to start with, with Melissa, kind of thinking about why identity and, and why now and why the people on this stage. Well, that's <laughs> no pressure. big. Uh, before I answer that question, I want to say that if you're interested in my colleagues, the custodial and janitorial workers, you can meet two of them. <coughs> my colleague Jerry and Odelia both contributed to the census exhibit out there, and so find them in there because they have really great stories to tell. Um, why identity? Why now? Uh, I think you said it, Walter, when you said this is an incredibly divisive, time for us to be alive right now. Um, in this country, it seems that we, we're at a place that we're all trying to make sense of, right? How did we get here? Um, I think we all need tools to understand each other, and I think that identity uh, is a lens and a mirror for where we are right now. I feel, and I think my colleagues at in the Exploratorium, especially the team that worked on the project, believe that that uh, it factors into everything that we're dealing with. We have a climate crisis. Identity is part of that. We have cultural challenges. We have the largest population on the planet we've ever had. We're seeing migration in, in numbers that we've never seen before. And yet we have to figure out, just as people, what that means to us. So that's why, and I have great faith in my colleagues here who've spent 50 years uh, getting really good at helping visitors uh, be, you know, make their own inquiries into this. And that's partly because we start as learners as opposed to experts, but we get the best smartest experts we can find, including Duena Fo Wiley, who's also sitting in the audience right in front of us. So, so is that a good, is that good? That was great. Okay. <laughs> and um, whoever wants to jump in next. 
about the same question, right? I'm, I'm, I'm asking, I think your, both of your individual work and, and, and research and writing kind of obviously deals with this, with this question of, of identity, but I kind of wanted to, to know um, in the context of this exhibition and really in this sort of like cultural moment, you know, why this question of identity matters right now. I guess I can start. Um, so yes, I, I'm a social psychologist, so I think about identity quite a bit. And um, I, um, you know, as the, as social psychologists, we also um, kind of talk about identity or the self as being um, uh, we have multiple selves, and so. Um, what, which self comes to the surface, which self uh, presents um, itself at a particular time kind of depends on the situations that we find ourselves in. And um, I feel like we are finding ourselves in this situation right now. Um, so about a couple months ago, the Pew Research Center released a study um, showing that six in 10 Americans uh, feel like race relations in particular are generally bad. And uh, the majority of Americans feel like things are getting worse uh, in, on that front. And I feel like you know we're kind of you know at a at a crisis moment um, in our history. And so we so so I think as um, social psychologists we think about identity kind of changing in the moment. So you can be in a particular situation where a certain self will emerge or, and another self will, will recede to the background. And I feel like as a country, you can think about us being in a moment uh, like that too. And so what selves are we now? And um, how is um, sort of what's going on around us um, sh shaping who we are and, and, and how we see the world? Um, I'll stop there, I guess. <laughs> no, I think that's really powerful. I mean, another way to think about this for me is that we live in this historical moment when every institution that we rely on to have our sense of collective life is grinding us like into, like it's like obliterating us. Like all the institutions that we rely on, they don't work. We're like, education is not teaching us. Like the economic system is uh, destroying our ability to like make a living. Like our government doesn't represent us. And so one of the things that we all do collectively to respond to that is to like hyper expand our sense of identity to create a sense of self through like Instagram or the internet or whatever that seems to try to protect us or shore up our sense of who we are. And I think one of the, one of the pitfalls of that is that we lose the sense of what it means to have collective life. So it's like, I have to articulate my sense of self so intensely that I don't know what it means to be in communion with others. So we talked about this in the back. You know, when I teach my queer studies students, like so many of my queer students, my queer students of color, they have such a deep investment in saying like, I am this thing, these are my pronouns, this is who I am. And if you don't recognize me in this way, I will X, like I will die social death. I will lose my sense of who I am. But what happens in that process, as important as that sense of self is, is like they don't know how to look around at their peers and be like, who are you? Like, I want to get to know you. Like, can we talk about our like general collective life? So I think a lot of the conversation we had about this exhibition was like, how do you honor the fact that people are really invested in developing a public sense of identity right now through all of these digital and other popular forms, while also saying, by the way, when you're doing that, you're actually engaged in civic life and you don't even know it. So like, we wanted to show people like, what, what are the public political dimensions of creating a sense of self? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, that's perfect. And, and totally. One thing that the exhibition outside kind of like uh, delves into is, you know, this like extremely dense glossary of, of, of words and like terminology that, that we now have access to, right? I think as, as a society. And I think that's like partly generational where I think, you know, if, if you're a young person or student these days, you have access and time and privilege to, you know, to think about your identity in ways that maybe our parents and grandparents did not, right? So I think about, again, I started this this talk with like, what do we do with that information? But then what do you do with like students of yours, right? Who who obviously are sort of coming into these like terms and, and identities. Um, this is who I am, this is this is who I represent. These are the worlds that I represent, and they do. Um, how fruitful is it to to really think about, you know, uh, themselves in that way without thinking about the other, right? 
Does that make sense? Um, you know, really thinking about how, how identity can, can sometimes serve as a bridge, but also as a way to divide us, right? So is there a way maybe in your teaching that you are helping students sort of come into themselves in this way? Do, do, yeah, yeah I, I can start with it. Um, I mean, I think the key bedrock for me is developing a sense of historical imagination. Like, I want students to project themselves back into another moment and to see that, A, people have been talking about what they're talking about forever, one. Like, they didn't invent it. They think they invented, like, me, like, see me, understand me. I'm, I'm like, yeah, you, like, like, a lot of people have like, been interested in that. And I want them to actually step out of themselves. Like, I want them to actually think about, like, what was it like for a hippie queer person to move to San Francisco and to meet the coquettes? like in 1970, and to be like, oh my god, I could go out in public and dress like a geisha superhero warrior and like be on LSD. Like, what is that? Like, what is that world, right? And I think uh, part of what shocks my students is precisely how radically different people are. Like, they think they figured it out. They're like, race, class, gender, sexuality, disability. And I look at them and I'm like, five? five? That's it? Like, five differences? I'm like, temperament religious and spiritual belief, intellectual capacity, you know, all of these things. And so what shocks them is the idea they're so obsessed with an inclusion model. Like, we want to include everybody, and everybody's equal, and I'm like, everybody is not equal. Like, everybody is different, and that's actually valuable. Like, you're not, not everybody in this room is as smart as everybody else. Not everybody is as talented, and that's not a bad thing, right? And so part of what I try to do is to show them that, like, they have the creative capacity to imaginatively leap the distance from themselves to other people who existed at different historical moments. And I think what unlocks for them when they see that is the broad range of positive affects that difference produces. So they step out of their sense of woundedness, we were talking about this also, like of like, oh, my identity always works against me. Like it always oppresses me. And they're like, oh, there were also queer people of color who experienced exuberance and happiness and community as well as oppression and suffering. And like all of those things were happening and I'm capable of engaging that entire sensorium, right? And that's part of what I do is I actually just bombard them with stuff they've never seen popular culture and movies, you know, and, and I make them read stuff and they're just, they're constantly amazed. And that seems so simple as just like exposure to other worlds. Right. Absolutely. Did you want to add to that, Jennifer? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to add to this. So, it's clear, right, that I think so much of our identities are not only how we perceive ourselves, but how we're perceived in the world, right, and, and, and in society. And I think so much of your work kind of deals with this idea of bias, right, and how I think whether it's melanin, whether it's pigment, whether it's like bone structure, whatever it is, um, they're usually, that comes with like a certain like classification in our world and, and, and meaning and, 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 and different reality, right? Um, your work, your book, Biased, and, and, and maybe how you consulted here earlier in, in the earlier stages of, of this exhibition, um, really kind of, we see that in, in, in each of the, uh, the, the uh, pieces here. Is, is there something that you think about, like, like how we're choosing to look at one another, right? And, and this idea of, of, of bias that you've seen maybe change like in the past like five, 10 years, and maybe how your research has evolved and how that question has evolved for you? Yeah, so um, I think um, people use the term bias in, in different ways. So um, there's a kind of unconscious or sort of implicit bias that I um, have focused a, a lot of my uh, work on. And that's the, it's the kind of bias. It's so basically it's the it's beliefs and the feelings that we have about social groups that can influence our decision making and our actions even when we're not aware of it. And so um, it's not about uh, a, a moral issue or, or being a, a good or bad person. And it's not about uh, intentionality. Um, uh, you can be motivated to um, do the right thing and be good, but, but then still act in ways that um, uh, could be infected uh, by bias. And so um, I think uh, oftentimes when people think about bias, they're thinking about like old fashioned racists and they're thinking about people burning crosses. They're thinking about, um, 
you know, people who hate, um, and um, you don't have to be a hater necessarily to, to have this bias. And so uh, that's what I wrote the book about. It's, it's what I teach about um, as well. And I, it's, um, yeah, it's one of those things that, especially now, it's, uh, it's a difficult subject to talk about. And, um, you know, bi bias is one of those things too where, just like the self, right, that um, it's conditional, so it can kind of change across different situations. And so just because we're vulnerable, to, and I believe we're all vulnerable to this unconscious or this implicit bias, doesn't mean that um, it's always, you know, something that's activated. Um, it doesn't mean that we're always going to uh, behave in ways that 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 show um, that bias. And so, um, the key is figuring out sort of what the situations are, what the conditions are um, that um, you know um, uh, trigger it or give rise to it, and then to try to. Um, you know, to, to, to be mindful of that. Uh, and, and I think being mindful of that, you're also being mindful of the harm that can come from bias because even though, again, you need to be a bad person, you don't need to intend it, but um, you know, whether it's implicit bias or this explicit bias, it can all still have um, this you know, like negative consequences. It can all do harm. And so, so that's, why, um, that's why you wanna be, that's why you wanna be mindful of it. And I think, um, in terms of its connection to the exhibit here, um, we're thinking about sort of self in these same ways, right? That you can show up as a different person, as a different self, depending on the situation. And you know, sort of some situations call for, you know, um, you know, you have all these all these different selves that you can sort of bring out. And I feel like bias is in that same way where you. Um, you know, there are certain situations that can uh, tamp it down and then other situations that can give rise to it. And when it gives rise to it, you're giving rise to a, to, you know, to a, to a different, an aspect of self, but it's, it's still an aspect of, of self. Absolutely. Um, Melissa, in, in, in sort of designing the framework for this show and, and, and exhibition, and even when, when thinking about, I think, um, our own biases, right, and, and our own sort of need to, to question how we walk through the world and, 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 and how we see the world, was there something different about putting the show together that, that maybe kind of like forced each of the curators or people involved with the show to, to maybe question your own biases about, about how you operate in the world? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've been trying to think if I should tell the story or not. Um, you should, right? <laughs> <laughs> you tell the story. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, so, so when I try to explain the show and my, you know, my drive to do it, I've sort of figured that there's these two optical illusions that we have here in the museum. One is the old woman, young lady and one is the faces, faces. Yeah. And you know, when you start to see those, you either sometimes see the old woman or the young lady, or you see the faces or vases. But once you see those, you see them both, you can't unsee them, right? And I think initial inspirations, the initial project was seeded by learning from my colleague who's the head of living systems here about um, the Gila cells, which you'll find out in the exhibit in the story of Henrietta Lacks, which captured my imagination. Uh, but then about five years ago, I put a, should I tell this story? Okay. <laughs> you should. Yes. Uh, I told you this story. This is kind of how I got these folks, but um, I put a, sculpture out in front of the museum that was incredibly popular. It was, it was uh, done originally at Burning Man by a very talented pair of artists. Um, and it was, it was a, a stroboscopic zoetrope and it was surrounded by these monkeys that were swinging from this, uh, uh, it was sp supposed to be like an atomic bomb cloud and they were, snatching an apple from the mouth of a snake. And underneath it was a set of drums. Um, and one of my colleagues expressed concern that, that uh, 
uh, people of color would feel that it was referencing them. And that shocked me. And uh, when I talk to people about it now, I call it my white fragility moment, um, which is not a very attractive thing, but we have to talk about these things, right? So uh, in trying to understand what she was saying to me, I started to do a bunch of research. And that's how I found Jennifer's work, which was a, a which went completely different places, right? But, but helped me make sense of what I, why I was the way that I was, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, we're at the Exploratorium, we're discoverers and we like to, when we find something, we want to make it visible to other people. And so here we are. With Ramsey, I'll just say, it was this expansive idea of the ways that popular culture works out these things when some of higher culture is not noticing. And then high culture has always taken the art forms of popular mm -hmm. culture and then elevated them, mm -hmm. right? And made them their own. That's a, if you look at European history, that's kind of, a, thing that happens. So I stole him <laughs> for us. <laughs> and so we, ha I, we had a charrette, which is an architectural term, but to kick off the project with my team and a bunch of really smart people that we put in a room with us. And here, we are, here they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Jennifer? Oh, you, you just, when you were talking, you triggered something for me, which is, um, there's a quote by James Baldwin, um, who said, um, a journey is called that because you cannot know what you will do with what you find or what you find will do to you. And so I was thinking about that as you were talking and telling the story. Yeah, that's a great, there's a great, um, can I, can I read this? Of course, yeah. There's a great. Oh, sorry, I suck at holding a microscope. <laughs> I either pop my peas or, you know, I, I'm not very good at this. But uh, I was thinking about, what? You look good. Uh, that's all that counts. <laughs> but how can I next to, next to her? <laughs> but anyway, let's see. Uh, I feel like, so this is a path, just a quick thing from the, you should still read this book. I'm gonna read you. <laughs> a piece from the end, but for me this sort of says it all for me about the, all the process that the team has kind of gone through because we had to do this inside of our museum and have conversations with our colleagues as well as each other. Um, and uh, so, but I feel like this is the thing right here. So Jennifer says in the chapter at the bottom line of her new book on bias, institutional values, norms, and practices both dictate and reflect the cultural forces that shape society. They can be a resonant force for the sorts of social change that help derail bias, but it won't be simple, cheap, or without stumbles and scorn. And so that's like, that's what the work is about. And then here's a, a really nice one, too short, I promise. It turns out that diversity itself is not a remedy for, though it may be a route to, eliminating bias. But we have to be willing to go through the growing pains that diversity entails. We've learned that diverse groups are more creative and reach better decisions, but they aren't always the happiest group of people. There are more differences, so there is apt to be more discord. Privilege shifts, roles change, new voices emerge. So that's sort of what it's about, right? <clears throat> right? She, she wrote that. <laughs> Did you want to add anything to your own words, Jennifer? Nothing. <laughs> You're good? Okay, cool. Um, I think what you said is, 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 is very important, Melissa. I, I think, you know, this is 
the time to question, you know, the institutions that, that we exist in, um, to question whiteness, right, to, to question all these different things that have existed for, for generations without being questioned, right? And I think um, we're all better served for that, right? Um, to segue out of that, uh, last February, I did a, a story about uh, a certain cosplay community in Los Angeles, um, all black cosplayers who were sort of using the Black Panther film as a way to, to, to really challenge, you know, what cosplay looks like, right? I think historically it, it was like a very white um, sort of experience and, you, you know, you had folks who, who were using the film as a way to insert themselves, right? And that got me thinking about performance, it got me thinking about comic books, right, in ways that I'd never really thought of before. And, I, and you know, the, the part of the show that you curated outside was, was, was really incredible, you know, the part about drag, the part about cosplay, it, it, was, it was all sort of, I think, related to this idea of, about the role of imagination, right, in, in, in creating worlds that we both escape from and that we want to be part of, right? And I think um, I'd love for you to maybe expand on the parts that you curated outside and, and, and just walk us through, talk, talk us yeah, through them. Um, I actually want to link it to, to some of what you wrote. I think part of what is so powerful about what you, that last quote that you said, that, that, you, that you read, is like, diversity is not a value. It's a description of a human fact, yeah. Like, I find it so confounding that people talk about diversity, like it's a value of our community that we're doing. And I'm just like, diversity is the fact of like human life. Like everybody is different from everybody else. Like the famous queer the theorist, Eve Sedgwick, has this like very classic line. She says like her first axiom for thinking is always like people are different from one another. Like you just start from that bedrock. And something that I talk about in my work is that I use the word heterogeneity, uh, which we often, uh, uses a synonym for diversity, but I actually use it to describe how people negotiate their differences, which is what I think really matters. Mm -hmm. Like what really matters is what people do with their differences and the context in which um, they have conversations about them. And we know this in popular culture, right? Because popular culture is one of the places we encounter people who are not like us at a distance, imaginatively, but it doesn't do everything. Like if it did, then reading African-American novels would make everybody not racist. Like we would all be not racist now because like we've all read Toni Morrison, right? But like that's not how that works. Like it isn't a one-to-one -one relationship. But what I do think that popular culture does is it opens this lever. It's like the, fir it's the first step to that process that someone might become not racist, not homophobic, is the opening up of their affective life to difference, to being affectively open to otherness and difference. And that often starts with an unexpected and surprising encounter with culture. Like you see something and you're like, oh my, like you see Beyonce's homecoming and you're like, what is, who is this person? Like who's like, I know so many of my students watch that and we're like, I literally, my neurons have been shifted. Like I've seen, right? That doesn't do all the work, but that starts the work. And then there has to be a context for conversation in which that then becomes politicized and then becomes part of a, you know, something larger. So in my thinking about curating the popular culture section of the uh, exhibition, I really wanted to think about A, forms of popular culture that people like obsess over. Things that we attach so, like we put so much investment in, so people become hyper fans of comics. People love video games and they spend decades you know, playing them. But what fascinated me about those particular things is that we invest so much and we think it's all about us, but what we are doing in every one of those forms of popular culture is being other people. Like that's what I find so interesting and we forget that in the process. We're like, I'm identifying with the X-Men because that's about me. Or like I'm playing you know, the Legend of Zelda because I, that, that makes me, like I am the sword wielding elf. But really what it is is like you're not you. Like you're doing something else. And so what I wanted to do with the exhibition, with the, uh, the parts of the exhibit that I curated was to say, look at these things that help you have a sense of self, but see how at every turn you are you because you're always playing not you. And that is exactly what connects you to other people. Like that's one form of negotiating difference is being able to step out of yourself. And that's such a powerful skill. Like that's something you can train people to see and do. And so I wanted to, I, I also just wanted people to have fun. I wanted to people see things that they love in a new way. Yeah. I also wonder like, 
if what you just said, I think, applies to, to people who might identify with like historically marginalized communities, right? And this whole process of like not seeing yourself in, 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 in popular culture and society um, and having to see yourself in this like imaginative, like fictive world, right? And like kind of how that adds another layer of, of complexity, right? Because like then this like fictive space becomes the only space where you, you can essentially be something that's not like white or like hetero, right? Or, 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 yeah. or, or like a standard of society that we're all supposed to adhere to, right? To, to yeah, I, if you just are pressing on something that is so central to my work. So a lot of people who know me and know my work is like I often take a very controversial or counterintuitive position where I'm very critical of the demand for representational diversity. So, you, so I'll give you use the example of comics, right? So people who are in love with superhero comic books will often say like, there needs to be more queer superheroes, more bl black superheroes, more queer of color superheroes, et cetera. And the problem for me is one, if you introduce all of those characters into a world that is, that at every level is controlled in its creation, distribution, predominantly by white people, like what will happen is you'll get representational diversity and the next time Marvel decides to have a big event, they will mass murder all those characters, right? Like for entertainment value. Like I love Marvel, but like Marvel makes billions off of the genocidal massacre of mutant characters. Like that's, right? So the question for me is like, how do you diversify, but how do you also create the context in which those characters can have like a rich life. So for me, there has to be like a toggling back and forth between actually giving us characters that look like us and then giving us characters who written by, see, written by yeah, absolutely, like produced by like actual, the actual communities that are that of like, like diverse communities, but also the value of seeing our identities projected back to us like anew, in a new way. Like if you look at the superhero comic book, The Legion of Superheroes, what's so fascinating is there's so many black characters in it now that like none of them are African American. They come from other planets. Mm. And many people would say like, oh, that's so problematic. Like that's such a, right, that like plays out all of these stereotypes. But actually when the comic book is really doing its work well, part of what it's saying is it's recognizing that blackness can be projected into different contexts. And it can mean different things to different people. And like, what does it look like to see the categories we know so well in one way and to say like, oh, now I'm gonna like project it back at you in a different way. I think that creates openings for new political imaginaries. So that's a long way of saying like, we need both. We both need to see ourselves and we also need to change all of the contexts within which we see ourselves. And both things have to be happening at the same time. And they're just two different strategies. Absolutely. Um, I think we're going to transition. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think we're, we're transitioning into questions now um, yeah, so by the audience. Yeah. Microphone that I'll bring to you. Uh, so just go ahead and raise your hands. I'll pick a few for now and then we will. Um, so we'll go to you first. And we'll go to you next. And then we'll go ahead and go Check, check. Thanks for making yourselves available for this forum. This is um, incredible. Thank you for being here. Uh, my question is, so regarding the sense of self and the question of identity, whether it is of your own making or shaped by society and your environment, how can a person acknowledge that fact and yet be happy with themselves and remain positive despite the answer? Yeah. I mean, I think it, it speaks to the, um, the importance of um, shaping the environment, right? So um, if you shape, as you shape the environment, you shape the self. And so um, it just m means that you have to put um, a lot of, uh, you know, care into what those environments are. You know, I feel like a lot of the, the biases that we have um, come from, you know, the disparities that we see around us and, and that's the environment we're in and, and, and those um, disparities start to get processed in a way where we're automatically associating certain groups, so social, whole social groups with um, specific traits and, 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 and then that kind of goes on autopilot and then it feels like that's, that's natural and that's normal and all of that, but a lot of that comes um, from you know, the social environment that we're immersed in, that, and that environment kind of 
makes its way into um, you know, how our neurons are firing, it's, it's making its way into how uh, we're thinking and, and it's making its way into who we are a, a, as people. And so um, to have control over the self, you have to you know, have con some control over the social environment that that self is placed in. Uh, I, that is so right, and I'm gonna give a more like self-help answer. I feel like that's such a that's actually a rich answer that's like way smarter than what I'm about to say. But I I often tell my students who we were talking about this before, like my students who come into my class and they've taken like so many like queer and feminist studies classes and critical race studies classes, they like have figured out the world, and they've read they've read about the way oppression operates and they are really devastated. Like they live in a constant state of like. They're devastated because they now have a language to describe everything that is horrible. And I have to remind them, I'm like, A, there's the institutional and the structural, and then there's like, you have to go get your groceries. Like, you also have to live. Like, and you have to go like, have sex, and like, have intimacy, and like, be connected to people. And like, there's a level to which like, the volume has to be like, brought down. To, uh, at some, like, you have to be able to scale back and forth between the institutional and the structural and the everyday. And this is gonna sound like so basic, but really like I fundamentally for me, like what keeps me happy amidst like knowing all of this is the capacity to turn to people who are near me and to ask for the things I need. To like look at that, like even like at a one-to-one -one relationship to look at people within the queer community that I'm connected to and be like, I think this is what I need right now. Like I think I need intimacy. I think I need to be able to talk about X, Y, and Z thing and I think my students are so often like at the macro level that they forget that they have to like, the way that they're going to be nourished is through like intimate accountability between people who share love and connection. And I think they reduce a lot of their friendships to systemic analysis. So they're just like, I need all of these things, but like you are, I've read you through this book I just read in this class. And I'm like, well, instead of doing that, like why don't you say to that person, like I'm really struggling with X, Y, and Z things, I need this. And I think we're living in unbearable times. Yeah. Uh, my, I mean, our students are, part of the reason our students are spinning is because they are, they, they don't know what joy looks like. And I try to remind them, I'm like, joy looks like looking at somebody who is where you're at and saying, go ahead. I give you permission to go ahead, please give me permission to also live, right? And I think part of what we have to do is like, we, in the face of all this institutional madness, we have to actually turn to each other and be like, what do you need? Here's what I need. And I know that sounds like, that sounds so like a self-help book, but I think we have to do that. You know, instead of being like, this is what I know and I'm reading you based on that. It's like, what, who are you and what do you need, right? Like, So I was gonna, I'm like, even my answer is less good than either of you. <laughs> um, but I would just remind you that you have an amazing capacity for learning and you're a learner first and that you are capable of having a functional understanding of the world and figuring it out and that that in itself is joyful and that even with complicated problems of our humanity, we're lucky to have those problems. That uh, We're lucky to, right now, be the people that have the luxury to sit in a place like this and have a conversation and contemplate them. And so the, there it is, that's what I would say. We have another question. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, I'm curious, you know, we tend to talk about community as a very positive thing and it's something that can, you know, bring us some, some um, self-esteem and, and people to talk to about how we're feeling. Um, but how should we think about communities that are, are harmful, say conspiracy theorists or flat earthers or anti-vaxxers or, you know, it, there was an article this week about about women in a Facebook group who are giving their, chi their children a form of bleach to cure them of autism, and they're, they're sort of supporting each other's uh, basically theses about the world that, that may be harmful. I'm curious what you guys think about that. Deep, that's deep. Um, 
outside. <laughs> you do that. Yeah. You're like, how about ble bleach? Comments on bleach. Um, Okay, so uh, I might get a little like high theory for a second, in a second on this. Uh, I think that, I'm gonna make a comment on left politics and then link it to that. Uh, I think a really, really core problem with left politics today is that we have this idea, this, this investment in political purity. And we have this idea that's like, the only way that we can have political community, uh, like we definitely want diversity, but you have to believe what I believe before we start talking. Right? It's like, we actually don't know how to deal with radical alterity. Like, we don't know how to look at somebody who fundamentally does not agree with, like, basic premises and be like, but I still have to talk to you. So, like, what does it look like to me in the middle? And that's what real democratic politics is about, is it's not about being like, we all already agree on democracy, so let's have a conversation. It's like, radical democracy is about, like, we do not agree, and, like, how do we negotiate that? So, I am less worried about the existence of those groups. This is, where I'm, this is where I'm gonna get high theory. Like I'm very, very invested in the work of a political theorist named Hannah Arendt, which I think we, sh we should all be reading because she was the great theorist of totalitarianism in the 20th century. She wanted to understand why in the historical moment of the most abundance that we had produced Nazism and like, like how, how did that come about? And one of the things she says is that we're so obsessed with the idea of truth of like, like those people, like they don't get it. Like that's not true, bleach is not gonna help, right? Like we're so obsessed with that, like that's wrong. That we forget to really ask like, what is the context in which people come to believe anything in the first place? Wh how does the context need to change so that people start to say, actually it does seem like climate is changing. Like instead of being like, you are wrong, climate is changing, what's wrong with you? Which is what we love doing. Like, what if we ask, like, what, why is it that there seems to be a context in which people don't believe that? And, like, what is that context? So, for me, what matters is not chastising or saying those communities shouldn't exist. Like, people, if people want to associate, like, they can associate. I think we have to ask ourselves, what are the contexts in which those kinds of pernicious associations are coming into being? Why did we create a world in which people feel that they need to have conspiracy theories? Like, what is that? And so I think we should actually be talking when we talk about those things about the nature of public life. Like, what is the public life that we want? What kind of civic engagement that do we want? Why are we not creating spaces of public engagement that allow people to look at each other and be like, I don't think that works. And have someone be able to hear that and be like, I get what you are saying. Like, that's what I'm more interested in than the question of whether you're right or wrong. You know, like. We have another question here in the center. Thank you. Um, so first, <laughs> to respond to what you just said very briefly, yeah. you're reminding me of Kurt Vonnegut, who talked a lot about um, true and false communities. Yeah. You know, and it seems like that. But. Yeah. The ones that are built around ideas are not the real ones. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to tell a different story. Um, I'm one of the authors of an introductory computer science curriculum, uh, which started as a college curriculum, and then we started taking it to high schools. And um, at first, we took it to uh, individual high school teachers who were you know, uh, early adopter types. And what that turned out to mean was that either they were in private schools or they were in Palo Alto. Um, and so all the students were white or Asian, right? Um, and then um, we decided to you know, jump into the deep end and take our curriculum to New York City, which is a majority minority school system. Um, well, one of the early exercises in our curriculum was to write a game, a, a game program to play Hangman. And we got to New York and we were told right away, you can't do that um, because of the association with lynching. Right? Um, and I have to say, my first response was, oh, come on. You know, that, that's obviously not what we're about. Um, and then I sort of started analyzing that response in myself. And, and it's like, so what if we don't do that particular exercise? 
And we ended up writing one about Wheel of Fortune instead. <laughs> Um, about what? Build a wheel of business? Fortune. Oh, Wheel of Fortune, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, but th that instinctive resistance that I had, um, I don't know if I want to call that racism exactly, but in this particular context, it was um, a display of privilege, I guess. And um, the point of my telling the story is just that it's really hard yeah. to. Um, catch that in oneself. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree. I mean, it's, and, you know, I applaud you for being able to catch it and to talk about it. I mean, I think a lot of this, um, especially when it comes to bias, it's, it's, the, it's the thoughtlessness. It's, it's moving, um, you know, really quickly and, and actually not, and, and just relying on, um, these kind of well-practiced, you know, kinds of um, associations that we already have, and if it's a, if that, you know, the the hangman or whatever was good for you, it should be good for them. You know, it's it's not it's not it's the not thinking through, and and I feel like also we're living at a time where the technology is kind of taking us there too, right? Because we have all these um, products that we use where. You know, the whole point of the product is to take away the friction. So you don't, you know, everything's intuitive and everything is quick and it feels fluid and it feels right and and you don't have to think about anything. You're just using that thing and and that is where um, where you get bias. That's where bias lives is um, when you when you don't slow down and you're just relying on. Um, you know, when you're not thinking, basically, uh, you're just uh, you, you become um, a vehicle for um, you know, sort of you know, reproducing all the the stuff that we we see out there. So. Dwayne, I wondered if you had any thoughts about this, given the story and what you've curated for the exhibition. Okay. <laughs> So Duena has done, uh, while she's thinking about her answer, uh, she's looked at science identity in the exhibition as one of the things that she's talked about, but also who gets, who is, gets to be a scientist and how as well. So uh, what's your name? Brian. Brian. I really appreciated your story. Um, so I mostly, work with genetic scientists globally. And it's really interesting how m many of our politics in here and how genetic difference is written and taught and understood. Um, in the US context, it really aligns with racial differences in the kind of big three or the big five uh, especially when you get into products like ancestry testing. And so on the one hand, ancestry testing um, makes users feel like they have a little bit of, uh, you know, European or a little bit of African, but, and it can break up really static notions of race. But the, the kind of parental populations are still pretty static in terms of that continental imagination of, you know, Linnaean racial categories. And so um, it's really interesting. I study geneticists as an anthropologist. So I go into their labs and treat them as tribes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I set up my tent and observe. And in the beginning, they do have that kind of hangman moment of what's wrong? You know, some of them are scientists of color as well, right? So it's not that diversity is going to solve the issue necessarily. Um, and so just making through conversations and me presenting at lab meeting, you know, <laughs> here's what I see in the tribe. Um, it does, you know, ha make them have that moment of, okay, well, why am I... Uh, being resistant to changing my language here or my sampling practices around the globe. And it's slow work because this is very valuable in the sense of profitable mm -hmm. <laughs> um, science for medicine, for pharmaceuticals, for identity politics. And so it's, it's, it's hard to dislodge those ideas. But I definitely think that 
having conversations and getting scientists to see the, the bias, but also their attraction to certain concepts, right? This will work and this is our model and moving away from that is often a personal investment that has a longer imperial and colonial history to it. So we have time for just maybe one or two more questions if anybody has them. Hi. So um, there was something I observed um, when we first walked in. Um, at the bathrooms, uh, there was a sign, uh, uh, two signs that kind of um, were displayed that said if you were, I think, uh, what was it, five foot four and under, under uh, you went to one bathroom, and if you were five, six and above, you went to a different bathroom. And we stood there just watching people just kind of try to uh, figure out where to go. And for, the, and for the most part, those that were of color, they didn't really think about it. They just kind of processed it quickly and kind of went there uh, to one bathroom or the other. And those that were of, of Caucasian of descent, there was a pause and a, kind of a schism. And you can tell on their face they were trying to process what to do. There was a sense of, of agony. And it was interesting to watch as someone of color that they in this case, it was rare for them to kind of have to deal with a sense of lack of privilege in a way and have to figure out which bucket uh, they went, I mean like, uh, which uh, a bathroom to go to. And it was just fascinating to I just watch this experiment. <laughs> and as, as someone of color that wants to encourage my you know, colleagues and friends who are a privilege, how can I, in, in conversations, get them to understand that this is what happens to someone like me on a daily basis, where I have to deal with, you know, my lack of privilege, but also not having a choice in determining whether I'm privileged or not. So, oh. yes. yes. Congratulations, Sam, for that. Since you're one of the uh, creators of that project so, outside, yeah, just to speak on that briefly, I think that your the impact that you receive from that. Um, modified space in the Exploratorium, specifically for this night, is kind of what the, our co-creators um, had in mind when putting together this bathroom experiment. Um, just to talk about it very briefly, two colleagues, um, Schaefer Mazow and Sal Alper, did a kind of subversive, not really approved experiment in the staff bathrooms, where they wanted to see what it was like to remove the gender binary from the equation. And once you do that, what are the other kind of playful, provocative ways that you can ask people to reconsider or have that moment to um, reconsider what spaces they walk into and with what privileges? So that kind of rogue experiment, although it was um, imprecise and not necessarily well communicated out, was a great seed to continue this experiment out on the floor. And so that's led to us doing this bathroom boundaries exhibition um, or exhibit and many after darks. And I, again, I think that your experience is, is right on. And for my part on how, you, and which I, I won't have the best answer for my part, I think sending people to the Exploratorium to experience things like that, that then you could have that shared conversation or other colleagues you see if you're coming in. Again, I think that Melissa can also speak to what the exhibition's intent is, but encountering a lot of those situations where you realize that either, oh yeah, this is how it is, or it's like, oh, I never thought of it in that way. So I think bringing people, it's hard to initiate those conversations, but I think at the Exploratorium, we hope that we have that first um, kind of creative way to get people thinking or talking, but I'll pass the praise along to my colleagues who are running the experiment right now, so thanks for that comment. Thank, oh. I think we have one more question. Oh. Wow, I just, I really wanna, wanna thank you. Um, we've been working on this project on Treasure Island, I mean on, on Alcatraz Island, all about future IDs, working with, you know, people who've been in prison and, and it's been so, we've been so tunnel visioned on, on you know, people who are in prison and then, and their identity being stuck with that. And to think that, that it's, 
you know, people who aren't in prison are struggling with the same kind of identity and being able to go back in, and I work with them every day and be able to, to tell them that other people have the same problem. <laughs> and um, how powerful that um, it's not such an isolated problem and um, what beautiful speakers and, and educated and I'm just blown away. Thank you so much for inviting us and um, can't wait to find it. And you can uh, find out more about uh, their project because they're doing a public program with us with families. When, Sam? August 10th. So if My you birthday. I'm sorry, <laughs> Melissa's birthday. Um, so it feels like we're wrapping up. Those can are some very kind words. So I'll, I'll give the rest of this context and then we'll give oh, you all the last word. Um, the, yeah, so in addition to the After Darks related to the self-made exhibition, we also have a programming space in our black box gallery inside Gallery One here, which has been transformed into a comfortable community space, somewhat akin to a kitchen table or a you know, comfortable kitchen or comfortable living room where we can have these community conversations. And um, we're activating it throughout the summer with different groups coming in and Future IDs of Alcatraz will be one of those groups um, to present. So August 10th, you can learn more about that. Um, but let's hear final thoughts from the panelists before you know, we wrap I it up. You know, I just wanted to, I didn't want to scope over the fact that you, ac oh, yeah. you asked us a question. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. Because <laughs> you, no, because I, because you, you gave like a lovely commentary on the, exhi on, on the exhibit, so I think that we skipped over that. You were asking something that's really difficult, which is you're like, how do I get people to believe me that I actually live this experience? <laughs> Right? And like, one thing is your friends should believe you, A. Like, but B, if there's anything that I've grown to believe in my work, and this is something I'm really interested in my research, is like, we have such an incredibly elaborate vocabulary to understand how people are racist and homophobic and transphobic, and we have such a dearth of vocabulary to understand how people become not racist and like not homophobic, and people do change. And like, people are transformed, but I don't think it most often happens through reasoned debate. I don't think people are transformed on this by, by rational proofs. I think people have unexpected and surprising encounters with a variety of different kinds of situations and worldviews and people that kind of shake them to their core. And I think one thing that I'm learning as I grow older is that the, one of the ways that it happens is that you go into public spaces and you let the people that you're with know like when you're finding yourself uncomfortable. Like, I let people know, like, I go out and I'm like in a space and I'm like, oh, just, I just want, just like FYI, like, this thing is happening. And I just want you to know. Like, I'm still having fun and like, but I'm aware of this thing, right? And the other is to just articulate my vulnerability to people. Like, so my friends will clock me very quickly on this, which is that, like, my brother's also gay, but my brother presents physically as like much more masculine than me and was like very big. And we go to a lot of the same spaces, like he and his boyfriend and I, we go to dance spaces, we go to all these spaces. And I, like, there are moments when men speak to me in ways that are so rude and so aggressive because I don't fit like a, a certain kind of, like my voice doesn't match a certain masculine ideal, et cetera. And they are so nice to my brother, like in front of his face. Like they're like, oh, who is that? Like I've literally had that. When he's like, here's my brother. And they're like, who is that? Right? And it required me pointing that out to my brother and then being like, this really hurts my feelings, just FYI. Like, I'm capable of managing it and it's fine. And like, I remember seeing him finally be like, I think that's disgusting and I don't want to be in spaces where people act that way towards you. Right? Like, but it required that double movement of being willing to put myself out in space so he could see it and then also verbalizing it to him from a position of vulnerability because the way I used to do it was to be like, this whole culture is so like, you know, so evil and gross or whatever. He's like, it's fine for me, <laughs> right? Like he didn't understand it at the structural level and I had to just be like, it hurts me. Like I don't have fun when I'm out and I want to have fun when I'm with you, right? And so I think a lot of it for me, which sucks because we're already so vulnerable, is that I have to trust that I can be more vulnerable and that that vulnerability will be responded to. And I do that, and when it's not responded to, I'm like, gotta go, bye. <laughs> like, guess we're not friends. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I don't know what else to do besides that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm always following you. <laughs> 
anyway, um, uh, I don't know. I guess maybe as a last word, I, I would say that um, I feel like uh, I, I, knowledge is important, the, the science is important, but um, you know the stories are you know how people um, you know can actually take in the science and, and, and to see the world in a different way. You have to both um, be available for that and to be able to. Um, I don't know, to, to um, connect to something emotionally before you can um, have um, a theory or whatever it is actually really ch uh, change your life. And, and I, I just I felt like I learned that in a lot of different ways in, in uh, writing every chapter um, of, of the book uh, that I wrote. I, I, I met a lot of people um, on that journey of, of writing and I feel like the meeting them and, and hearing about their lives and them sharing their lives with me really you know, sort of changed uh, my attitudes, you know, ab about the science too. And I'll tell you one quick story that's relevant to uh, what you uh, just said, which is um, there's a, I was teaching at um, San Quentin, um, the, the state prison, and I, um, this was the first class I ever taught there was back in 2010. And I, um, I was nervous about you know going to prison and all that because I didn't know what the culture was like. I didn't know what it was like a whole different world. And so everything that I thought I knew, I had to suspend uh, because it, it was all just flipped or it was different. And and so uh, you know I was kind of nervous about that. So I go in and I I um, I'm at the you know in front of the classroom and I'm having people um, go around and say why it is they wanted to take the class, right? which is how I would start a class at, at Stanford. And so they all said different things, a lot of like common things. Yeah, actually, uh, just I need the credits, the units, you know, <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing. <laughs> so it was a lot of that. Um, but there was um, one guy I'll never forget. Uh, he said um, that uh, he knew a lot uh, already about how San Quentin worked and all of that and he knew like the culture of the place and so forth and um, he says, I'm taking this class because I want to know how free people think. And it just, I just was, you know, it just stopped me, you know, in my, in my tracks and I learned that he had been, he was in his 40s at the time, but he'd been incarcerated since he was a teenager, I think, and since he was 14 years old. And um, he was trying to act, get access to, like, free minds and what, what does that look like to have a free mind? And, um, and I felt like throughout the, the course and in, in sort of, that I was actually there to become free too, like I, I was, you know, they are trying to also, um, you know, uh, you know, sort of put away uh, the shackles that society puts on us, and and um, trying to see different and to learn in a different way, and to, um, you know, to be able to, um, I don't know, to connect um, in a, in a different way. So thanks for that. No, no, I mean, I just wanted to give our, our everyone on stage a, a round of applause. Uh, well, thank you so much to Walter for coming and moderating our panel. The conversation can continue. The museum's open for another 45 minutes or so, and we hope you come back and visit the exhibition again and again.